What's going on, everybody? Episode 17 of the Casual Millennials Podcast. Your host, Andrew Kubitz, on the microphone, joined, as always, by my co-host, Eric. What's up? Not much. Doing this on a Friday, which I don't know if we ever have, actually. I don't think so. So this is exciting. And we don't even have beers. We don't have beers involved. (laughs) That's sad. We've had beers on other weekday nights. Not the night you probably are more socially acceptable to have beers. Are beers an option? Beers are an option. Should we we get a a beer break? Should we do this? (laughs) No, we can just pause, get a beer break, introduce our <laughs> guests, I'll get beers. Cool. So with us today, we have someone who's pretty awesome. I'll let her tell a little bit more about her story, but Catherine Adamek, um, Olympian, Olympian medalist, nevertheless. So let's have you tell her. Yeah, let me, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, I, in 2010, I had a phenomenal opportunity to represent the United States in the Olympics in Vancouver as a short track speed skater. Um, and... I had a really, you know, long journey to get ready for that point. And so thankfully, all the hard work that I had put in, I got, again, so fortunate, so grateful that at the right time, on the right day, I got to win two Olympic medals. And it... Which is amazing. Just really, the the older I get, the more I look back at it, the more I realize, like, who does that? (laughs) Who gets to do that? things like I was a kid I was dumb I just thought like yeah okay I'll train hard I'll go race this will be good but the older I get the more I realize like um, a lot of things a lot of stars had to align there so since 2010 I've gotten into coaching I actually made a comeback for the 2018 games Um, I got I got hurt my preparation was not where it needed to be I did not make the team but I learned so much through that comeback process which has really made me uh, way more in tune and passionate as a coach. Um, I, I get to live my passion daily, which is helping others, teaching them how to have an, an easier time and learning the lessons that I really had to struggle through. So that's that's how I got where I am, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, Thanks course. for taking the time. Yeah, I guess we got beers now, some tall boys, so cheers. cheers. Yeah. Friday. This is Love so you can it. say you only had one beer in case you can only have one. <laughs> it gets all 16 ounces of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's talk about it. First of all, I'm surprised that the gold medals aren't on right now, or the medals aren't on. Um, I was expecting that. Like, I would always walk around and remember, like, yeah, just so you know. They hurt your neck. I'll be <laughs> honest. They're quite heavy. They're they're two or three pounds each. So if you get to, if you get both of them on after a while. So Michael Phelps' neck was going to go. Seriously. On there for so long. I, people don't really know this. I certainly didn't know this until I, I got to be there. Medals are, like, a good two or three pounds, but they're not big. Like imagine something half the size of your cell phone that weighs three times as much, two or three times as much, something like that. They're really dense. And so, um, yeah, for Michael Phelps to put 27 of those on, that's, well, if they're three pounds each, that's a lot of weight. I was gonna, I thought you were gonna do the math. I was, I tried and then I decided not to. I thought it could potentially be embarrassing, so I no, avoided that. It's all good. I teach um, one night a week. I teach intro to accounting. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting up there and it's like basic math because for all of those listening, accounting is not math. Um, but it's like, yeah, like seven times three and you're like, three, one, okay, got that. Yeah. And then you're like trying to do other stuff and you're like, I'm uh, holding there with a marker, no calculator. And I'm like, shit, I don't know if I can do this. So I've been there. Math check. <laughs> Jeez. I'm just like, I always say somebody with a calculator get this for me. That's what I do. Just get out of it. Two plus three. Just... <laughs> <laughs> he thought it me. Try to catch me there with that one. Um, so I think where I want to start anyway, because uh, I did a little bit of research before coming in, because uh, we have not met before, obviously. The mindset and coaching and all of that, you know, when you think, go, go back to those 2010 games, being younger, what was your mindset of like, then how has it changed and how like to me I couldn't imagine being you know younger and getting into such a stage like that and performing at the highest level and doing very well so well enough to medal um so looking back what do you think about it and um just go from there yeah when I in 2010 um I was a very anxious athlete and I I very personally identified with my anxiety and I thought that it was the reason that I was as good as I was because I was so anxious all the time about doing everything just right. And yeah, like that anxiety did push me to strive really hard and do things that someone who wasn't afraid of the future wouldn't do. That's my, that's kind of my definition of anxiety is especially when we talk about like generalized anxiety, which is just 
overrun in the culture right now. It's this underlying fear of what's going to happen next. What if it's out of my control? What if I can't do it? And there's no solution to these problems because you have no control over the future. So you're just stuck with this constant ongoing fear of it. Um, and if I was afraid of losing, well, then I was constantly managing all the pieces to make sure that I had the best chance to win. Mm -hmm. So that made me very detail oriented. It also drove me relatively crazy. Um, and I had success. So my success actually convinced me even more so that, yeah, it's this anxious personality that's really getting me there. Um, that's why my comeback was such a, a life changing experience for me to go back with more perspective, especially having spent time coaching. And so the biggest time that really changed the way I thought about it was I was coaching a couple of youth athletes who had very similar stories to me when I was their age. They were not, they were not shoe-ins to make teams or win medals, but man, they were gritty and they worked hard. But I would see how they beat themselves up. If they were one or two tenths off of a lap time, or if they got, uh, fourth place instead of third, which on one hand is heartbreaking because you're one point, you're one place off of getting a medal at the same time. It's not like your dog just died. Like let's keep this in perspective. We train hard and we compete so that we know what we need to go home and work on so that next time we're better. The world didn't just end. We just, we ate a piece of humble pie. It tasted really bitter, but now we know, keep moving forward. And as I was coaching these girls, I was seeing that this is how I used to behave. As a rational adult who wasn't living the emotional piece of it, I could see how much that anxiety and that really harsh judgment and fear was keeping them from being their best. So when I made my comeback, um, I kind of kept that with me. And when I was feeling very anxious or very afraid of the future, I would remember what would I have told these 16 year old girls as a coach. And then I, whatever I would have said to them, I just use it for me. And I was so surprised, but happy to find that my performance didn't suffer. Actually, I could do things with more engagement and more joy. And I could dig deeper because I was playing for pride as opposed to like playing to avoid fear or playing to avoid failure. Every rep of every set became, let me just dig deep. So just so I can see, I just want to know how deep this goes. And that place of motivation was, it let me dig deeper. And it was such a more satisfying way to live than what I'd been doing before. And so even though that comeback, like I said, I, I, I got hurt. I got a concussion. Um, I was out from January until July and we picked the team in December. And so coming from six months off and then only having six months, not only to get back on, but back on at the most elite level, that was very difficult. And I came close, but I couldn't do it. Um, and if I had had that same anxious mentality as 2010, I would have death spiraled after that. I wouldn't have been able to manage the depression that comes along with that. But keeping that perspective of how can I handle this from a place that's like, I'm just digging the deepest. I'm just seeing how deep this well goes because I like it. I want to know. Um, well, the well didn't go deep enough that day. And sure, that sucks. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. I wish it had gone better. Wish it had gone my way. Um, but when you let go of that anxiety, you don't have to relive the negative self-talk. You don't have to relive the doubt and like, oh, woulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Those conversations don't happen in my head because I had a shift in mindset. Right. It's almost, and sometimes I always feel like, well, you said it right away. And that was, you know, if you fail, you just go back to the drawing board or you go Dragon. back to the way to go back to whatever it is you're doing in any sense of the word, right? Or any sport, any academia, whatever it is, you can always build on stuff. And I think sometimes things get blown up too much, especially when it involves kids or younger adults, because mm -hmm. that can really affect the rest of your life, looking back at some of that stuff. So it's great to hear that you're kind of working with them and trying to get students, or I shouldn't say students, um, but, you know, young people out of that, especially at that level, who are some of the best athletes in the world. Yeah, and I think it's, <clears throat> to your point of students, a lot of the athletes I work with come to me and say, my schoolwork is better. I focus longer. I, I bounce back from negative test scores better and just realize like, oops, I didn't learn that. Let me go back and do my job instead of play the, the tape that goes through your head that 
says all the, the harsh negative things that that recording or that however you like to think of it that tape player is what's distracting athletes students people whatever from the task at hand which is that didn't go well there's something that I, I missed I need to go back and learn that lesson and then try again so it's taking those failures and really learning from them That's basically it, what it comes down to right absolutely and I think why that is difficult is because it does hurt. It does have the tendency to hurt your feelings when you have to look there and say like, you know what? I really should have known better. Especially when you're dealing with the types of people that you're dealing, they're so competitive that mm -hmm. always want to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, it's not that it doesn't hurt your feelings. Yeah. It's just that you can play the tape player and go through that forever. Or you can say like, this is going to hurt for five or 10 minutes for me to really truly self-reflect and, and acknowledge my weaknesses, but then I can do something about it and I can move on and the tape player won't continue to play. So for me, that's a fair trade. I'd rather have five or 10 minutes of like, mm, this hurts and then move on. It, it, like I said, it's just such a more effective way than continuing to play the negative self-talk on repeat. Yeah. I'm one that learns best. Like I have to, I have to make the mistake one before I even know that it's a thing. Sure. So then I know how to fix it. But then like sometimes, um, I hate, I feel like I talk about it a lot, but so I just, I trained jujitsu now just recently. Oh, so cool. I'm a couple months into that, which is awesome. But like when you make a mistake or something, it doesn't, you know, you don't fail you if somebody choke you up basically <laughs> or try to break your arm off. Um, so it's a painful <laughs> reminder. I'm like, Oh, don't make that mistake sure. again. But like things like I will roll, you know, I'll roll three or four times a night and, it takes me like a week for me to really remember something or to like really get that muscle memory down. It's almost like you have to continue to fall, continue to fail, to really pick it up before it happens next time. So I think that's the biggest thing is preventing it, right? Yeah. And so that's where it starts to turn mental because you're talking about awareness. Mm -hmm. And the first, you, you can't solve a problem if you haven't even recognized that there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you're saying, it might take you a few times. You're going to have to see the situation three or four times, but then you're going to see there's a pattern here. Every time it looks like this, I'm on my way to something bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And as soon as you can recognize that or even have the awareness to plan ahead. So, you know, kind of a big, uh, law of attraction thing is like visualizing. And so I'm, I don't, I'm not incredibly far deep into the law of attraction, but I did visualize myself when I was training. I didn't, I'd visualize myself winning, especially on the workouts that I didn't think that I could, that I was pretty sure that I was going to keel over and die. Those are the moments that I would visualize what it would feel like to win a medal. And I got through the hard parts that way. And now in my life, I do the same thing where if I know full well that what, for example, Wednesdays are really hard for me. They're, they're not 12 hour days, but they're 11 AM to 10 PM. And so it's only, it's, it's just a really long time and they end late at night. They kick my butt. But if I wake up in the morning and I can think ahead and I can visualize, you know, around six o'clock, that's when I get really, really tired. Let me just imagine myself grabbing a snack on my way to the gym and walking into that gym with the kind of energy that I want my athletes to walk in with. And because I just took that the 15 seconds that it takes to see myself doing that later on in the day, when I'm approached at 6 p.m. with the temptation to be negative and tired, I've seen this before. I recognize this pattern and I know what I'm going to do about it. It really helps me get through the hard parts of my day. Interesting. So let's stay in visualization because I think that sometimes some people like it. Some people don't think it works like that. Um, so it like. I've been debating on whether I should actually go into competitive jujitsu or not. Mm. And my lack of self-esteem always continuously tells me no, because I haven't really wanted anything, especially when it comes to um, anything that is physically like active, like, right. I've only usually been good at academics. So I think about myself winning, but then I always go, well, that's never really going to happen. You're going to get your ass kicked. Mm. So how does one kind of step out of that? Maybe a little personal coaching. Yeah, <laughs> but, sure. yeah. <laughs> There's a saying I really like okay. it's competence builds confidence. Mm. And so, what you're describing is that you want to be confident that you can go and achieve something on an athletic scale, but you haven't built up the competence along the way to really feel confident. Right. So on paper, I'm sure you can write out all the reasons why you should really give this a go. Mm -hmm. But then in action in life, you have to take those baby steps so that your confidence isn't false. You have competence behind it. Mm. That way when someone 
I wish you didn't even say someone. Sometimes somebody will come in and, and kick you down. Most of the time we end up kicking ourselves down, right? Like we think a lot harder about ourselves than anybody else does. But whether it's external or internal, that way when the conversation comes up that starts to make your confidence feel questioned, you can actually, no, I've done this. I am competent at this skill, at this behavior. I've practiced it. I've gone through adversity and I've still come out the other side. I've earned my confidence. Mm-hmm. I have the right to think I can do this today. Some people think they can do this today and they haven't earned it yet. And, and that's what empty confidence look like, looks like. That is, we're talking like kind of arrogance there. Sure. But there is a way that confidence is earned through grittiness and doing the things and learning the lessons and feeling competent at those skills. And at that point, no one can attack your confidence. You've done your job. Right. Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah. Have you ever read the book, Can't Hurt Me? Mm-mm. By David, David Goggins. Goggins. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. Done a lot of visualization talk in there, like how important it is to okay. just succeeding. He's a mental freak. So. He's a total mental freak. The guy is crazy. Yeah. I will have to check that out. If you, if you don't want to read the book, he's also on Rogan's podcast twice. Ooh, even better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My friend runs and listens to that podcast on repeat. And it's like a wow. four, it's like a two and a half hour long podcast. Yeah. David Goggins. Yeah. That will be my very next Rogan podcast I listen to. Probably my next book. The guy's a badass. Cool. Yeah. Oh. I can lend it to you if you want to have the book. I'd love to. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, he runs like ultra marathons and he was a Navy SEAL. Yeah. Yeah. And before that, he was like 300 pounds. Yeah. Wow. I'll let you. If well, no, it's, that's really it, man. It's, it's crazy. Like I've, I'm reading that book currently. I'm like three fourths of the way through it. And like, there's been a lot of stuff that I've just kind of like learned. Mm-hmm. Just throughout it, just about how he really views, and I really believe it, like, you achieve more through your mind. Like, it's always going to be your mind that you're battling with versus, you know, your sore legs. Because once you get past that one point, it's, you know, you don't even realize it anymore. Absolutely. I was working with the hockey team last night, and the coach brought me in, and he was asking me, can you go over some recovery methods, ice baths, foam rolling, stretches, whatever. And within the first 10 minutes of chatting with this team, it was actually the coach who asked them, like, okay, boys, let her know. Share with her. Where were you stuck on Saturday? Not a single one of them said that they were under-recovered. They had a four-game weekend. So we're going into it thinking, like, their legs are dead. Not a single one of them said I was tired. Every single one of them said I was in a low mental place. I just I couldn't get my energy. So not that they weren't tired, but it's not like their body wouldn't respond. It was like they couldn't get their mental energy up enough to approach the game with the intensity that was required. Yeah, it's a different type of tiredness. It is. Mental versus physical. It totally is. And the thing about physical things is that you, I mean, I've just, the best example is like whoever's listening, there was a point in your life when you were super tired and it was a Friday or Saturday night a little headachey, really wanted to stay home. And then your friend called and said, yo, I got tickets to this amazing thing. Let's go. And all of a sudden you weren't tired anymore. Hell yeah. Tired isn't real. It is a state of mind. Yeah. And if you want to push through your workout more than you want to be tired, you will do that. You will choose the state of mind that requires your level of intensity to rise. Um, and don't get me wrong. Sometimes you crash. Like sometimes you have 10, 12 hour days in a row and Fatigue is not a state of mind. Fatigue is a real thing. I was going to say, exhaustion is a real thing. (laughs) Exhaustion is a real thing. (laughs) But there's a difference between fatigue and tired. And if you get the two confused, then you get in this mindset of like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm tired. It's important to be honest about managing your fatigue because you can't be your best self if you're falling apart at the seams. But if it's a matter of tired, tired is a state of mind and you can do something about that. Absolutely. And like basically in this book, he says, you know, it's you are in battle with yourself all the time. Like the minute you, it's so much easier to say, no, I can't, than yes, I can. You totally. Know? And I, I don't know, it's, I've really enjoyed reading this book so far. I don't know. He, so he does two things. Like, yes, all of the things he talks about is very true, but he also overtrains like a he does. motherfucker. Oh, he does. interesting. Like, no like, one should be. He, that. I mean, he finally got through the Navy SEALs. You're through this book already. And it's not like it's anything super embarrassing to spoil anything, but. He makes it finally makes it through Buds in the Navy SEALs after he shins were basically broken through Hell Week, oh, and they run like five broken. miles a day. He duct taped them every day. I know this guy. Yeah. I heard of this guy. Okay. Yeah, no, he duct taped them and ran out every day. I'm like, that's not that's, what that's you an, do. Yes, that's <laughs> not it. <laughs> but, that is what not it looks like. Yeah, yeah. but that brings me to my question: Is overtraining like what? 
how can someone tell if they're overtraining? Like I, like I didn't go to the gym at the end of the day because I was just tired from the week. I was just exhausted. And mm-hmm. I can tell my body needs rest, but how does one differentiate between that and just kind of being tired in that mental state? state? Great question. It is. I think. Um, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the role of the coach in that in that case is very it's critical Mm -hmm. and we're really lucky to live in a time where if you want to know the answer to something you can listen to a podcast you can watch it on youtube and you can learn the things but being able to self-manage your fatigue i don't i actually don't know any athlete that can do it um so you as a coach how do you tell for your yeah people you're training um the first thing is that people are actually tired when they stop talking so if your buddy walks in the room and it's coffee break and you, if you have enough energy to tell a story, you're not really tired. <laughs> when people are legitimately tired, they walk in the room, they sit down and they just stare right ahead of them. And that's how I know, okay, we're lightening up the workout today. Um, but if you can come in and tell stories to your friends and then tell me that you're tired, you're not really tired. So you can manage that way. Um, for my, when I was training, I always knew that I was tired when my skin got really dull and I know that that feels silly, but sometimes I would look at pictures of myself in season and you can just see it. You can see that my nails would get really brittle. My eyes would get kind of bloodshot and you don't see it when you look at yourself in the mirror every day. But when I look back at certain times of season, you can see that someone's physical appearance just starts to look dull. And if you could walk into the room with radiant energy everywhere you went, you would, because that's kind of a cool life skill if somebody could do that. And if, if you're really at your best version of yourself walking in dull, you probably have a pretty serious state of fatigue going on. Um, I also notice the athletes who need to rest the most are the ones whose brains are talking to them the loudest and fastest. So if you're in a state where you're really questioning, like, should I do this? And you're having this inner monologue with yourself about like, oh, I think I can, but man, I really feel bad today. That's kind of a sign that just the fact that you're having to work so hard to talk yourself into this, bodies do get tired for a reason. Um, And if, if your body is telling you that it's tired for a reason by Uh, maybe you slept 12 hours last night, which is uncharacteristic of you, or you have achiness in your body, or you feel like you've had to have four cups of coffee before noon. Your body is telling you that it's tired. You making up a story in your head about how you should push through it won't change the level of fatigue. But so I think this is hard because it's hard to stay in an objective state of mind, which is why I think the role of coach is very critical here. When you're in the middle of that self-talk, it's hard to tell which voice is rational and which voice is just pushing you. Um, So a coach can help you do that. Um, You could also become just a mental master. You could read all the books and meditate every day and do all the things. And um, someday I think it's probably possible for someone to be so tuned in that they know exactly what to do. But that is true mastery. I think that that's like a Bruce Lee could probably do that. But that also comes with bringing it back to where we started kind of the conversation where you have to go through those things mm-hmm. to really know yourself. Mm-hmm. Then, like I know like I'm really exhausted when my eyes are just super heavy and like I had bags under my eyes, like my eyes were bloodshot the other night, mm-hmm. like this week was super rough. And I woke up like I was hung over this morning just cause I was so exhausted this entire week. And I'm like, I just didn't want to get out of bed. My body was just sore. It was like, shouldn't have done that. But you know, sometimes your week's like that. But yeah. I mean, it just comes from going through that stuff and knowing it, right? And now you know. So next time you have those physical markers, you don't need to convince yourself to keep going. You can say, "Oh, I see the pattern. Yep. I know that. I know what this feels like, and I'm going to take a rest day." Yeah, like I'm not looking at my email. I'm not. I'm just going to go to bed. <laughs> right. But then when you start to talk about someone who's <clears throat> taping their shins with duct tape to keep going, <laughs> that's a phenomenal feat. But I'm not sure that he was noticing the pattern there and adjusting adjusting properly. If you're in Navy SEALs training, I know that you're. Obviously, I know. At some point, you just have to do the work because you, you can't show weakness. I do understand that, but we are not we are not Navy SEALs. It was like, also his last time he could go through it. Yes, if he didn't pass it, he could never go back. So it's sometimes it's worth it, yeah. and I would say the same thing to athletes or to listeners that you can make that decision. Um, like you just said, sometimes you get ten days in a row or a, a, just a week. That's it's too hard. 
And sure, hindsight's twenty twenty. Next time I won't go this hard. Until the next time someone calls you with a phenomenal opportunity and this is exactly what you wanted, but it's going to require you to have two really hard weeks. Okay, push through it. Two weeks, let's go. But when you're in that chronic state every single day, that's when it, you start to get in trouble. Yeah, and it's a lot easier when it's two weeks. You can visualize it in those two weeks. Totally. You can rest when, you, rest when you're done. Well, that's exactly, that's perfect. Well, I was just going to mention, because I listened to a podcast hosted by Andy Stumpf, who's also a former yep, ABC. I've definitely heard his. Um, he talks, he used to be a buzz instructor. Mm-hmm. And he always talks about how you can tell the people who are going to make it and the people who aren't going to make it. And how he got through it was like, he just, because it's, but like how week is like seven days, I think. Mm-hmm. So you can... I think it's like sun up to sundown, so you can go by when the sun rises and the mm-hmm. sun sets. You can go, they have to feed you every six hours. So you know that going in, so you could go every time you eat, so it's a six hour pattern. But he goes, you just have to really minimalize like the amount of time that you're gonna make a goal. Like, okay, just get to this and then you're done, and then get to this set and then you're done, right? So they, that was kind of something that like, when I have really long days, it's like, okay, let's just get here and then we'll feel good and then we'll get, we'll get there and then we'll be almost there and then we're halfway out. So I think that's a good way. I don't know if you For sure. do that way at all. Coaching. I used to do the same thing when I was training. So we would do these 50 or 100 lap workouts. Mm-hmm. And for 100 laps in a row, even starting on lap one, the, the deal I'd make with myself was like, just do five. Mm-hmm. And okay. then after five, I was like, you know, that's okay. Okay, just do five. And I'd keep doing that. And I'll tell you what, I would go down all the way to like, just do three, just do one, just do a half. Anything to keep going. Yep. Um, I, I don't think I ever had to go any lower than a half lap because that's about five or six seconds. But we are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was having to tell myself every five or six seconds, like, okay, keep going. Yeah. Just five more seconds. Just keep going. And um, I haven't I haven't had to do that in my life. I should probably start because thinking back, that really helped me get through a lot, and it makes your time go faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we go back to that competence builds confidence, if I am not confident that I can do a hundred laps, but I build competency over time, if I know that I can string five laps together 20 times in a row, I, I earned, I can earn my confidence that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to start with the skill that I feel competent at. And so, yeah, break those def- break those goals down small. That's how you develop your confidence to do the really big things. Not only that, but I think you feel a little bit more accomplished or maybe a little bit better about yourself as you're kind of going through that. Because you're like, okay, I did that. All right, we can do another five, almost like you said. And then eventually, yeah. sometimes it'll get down to a small portion, but whatever it takes. Or the best is when you for, you start forgetting to count. Yes. And before you know it, you're like, oh, man, I just did 20. <laughs> and you didn't even know. That's the like that's your state of flow. That's yeah. the ideal place to get to. No, I definitely agree. I, I was a runner. Never, like, anything past high school. But I used to be called, like, a natural runner. Mm-hmm. And I... I might have some friends that would be pissed off like at me for saying this, but I don't think I was like a natural runner. I think like I was naturally able to power like through that. Yeah. Like, that's, I don't know. It's like that one chick, that one, like the Moab 240 by like three hours. She like didn't sleep. She slept for like a minute oh or a couple gosh. minutes. Like she was losing her eyesight by the end of it because her body was so stressed. But she's like a normal human being. She can just mentally shut everything off and just run for however long. She did like a day and a half or crazy shit yeah it's wild it's wild so i want to go back to your story about um the navy seals training camp the butts because Mm -hmm. i actually got to do a navy seals training camp when i was training Mm -hmm. um not not like hell week or anything i think it was like three days um but still it was hard it was (laughs) was hard was it a continuous three days or was it like you went there for eight hours a day and then you went home or it was worse we would go to navy seals training for the first half of the day. Wait, were you then, actually there with the like, uh-huh, Uh huh. In California, nice. where Coronado is that? Where I think that's where. Yeah, it's yeah somewhere in Southern California. Yeah. Um, I think for one or two days we were there the whole time, but we were also on team training camp. So we were doing we were doing this Navy SEALs training camp, and then going to the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista and doing our speed skating training. It was insane. It was really not not a not a great time in my life because I was in an extreme state of fatigue, not just tired. Like that was before I needed all my hip surgeries. Mm. But I mean, I needed them. I just hadn't gotten them yet. I needed these hip surgeries, but I hadn't gotten them yet. So still kind of fighting through and training through. And our instructor said that the only way you're going to get through this is to embrace that this sucks. That's why you're here, 
to, to train through the fact that this sucks. And he made it really real for us. He said, when you are at the real legitimate Navy SEALs Hell Week, the fact is that in the line of fire, like when you're on duty, your buddy, like your, your person, your guy could be standing right next to you and you could go down. That's the type of realness that they're dealing with. And if you wallow in that suck for one second, you're going to. You have to embrace that that sucks instantly and move forward. And I'm so grateful that I don't have anything in my life that that's that is that intense. Yeah. When I've when I'm in that mental state of feeling like oh god I can't keep going, I remember like there are people out there who have like, real and serious life altering things happen to them. They have to embrace the suck. I'm just working a 12 hour day. It's not that bad. But don't you think that can sometimes backfire though too? Like that mindset of saying, oh, somebody's got it worse off than me because mm-hmm. it can almost, it can almost talk you into like not dealing with your problems or like you could be depressed and be like, why should, why am I, why would I be depressed? I have a house and some people don't have houses, right? Mm, yeah. That's an interesting way to think about it. I can certainly see that. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose I'm going to add a little, a little twist onto that and say, sure. it depends how you're talking to yourself. And if you're saying like, oh, come on, pick yourself up. You don't have it that bad. Mm -hmm. That's one way. Whereas another way might be to think to yourself like, wow, like for one minute, just really live in the idea that I I get to have a house. I get to have clean water. I get to have people who believe in me. You know, as someone I had, a, I didn't have a, a traumatic brain injury. I just had a really persistent concussion. And for about six months there, Things, normal things would make me dizzy and confused. Lights would give me headaches. And I'm so grateful that I can look at a computer screen again, that I can watch TV with my husband, that I can eat out, that I can not feel dizzy and confused when I'm trying to talk to my friends. And so there's a way to talk yourself through that that's basically making it sound like you're a loser and you need to to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to talk to yourself that way saying, legitimately your life's really good like just live in that for one minute and the energy you'll get from experiencing true gratitude will help you get through if it doesn't help you get through that would be a sign that you're dealing with a significant amount of fatigue and it's probably time to start listening to your body and slow down sure yeah that's, that's the way i'd go with that yeah i'm gonna ask for that yeah. no uh, I would love to hear how your transition from being an athlete to a coach has been, what that mindset's been like. Can we, can, let's bring it back, actually. Let's, oh, get, let's okay. go to how you became an <laughs> everyday person to an Olympian. I don't know. I, well, I was never an everyday person. I was a, I was yeah. a, perfect. Let's hear it. I was a child. I was a child phenomenon. I was very good at my sport by the you age of seven. You are a childhood phenomenon. Oh, not a child. <laughs> okay, so when did like yeah. when did you notice or someone noticed like, hey, Catherine's not normal? Um, I started training with the adults in my speed skating club probably by the time I was seven. I started training with the teenage boys in my skating club by the time I was nine, and by the time I was twelve, I was the only girl on like the competitive team. And all the rest were 16 and 17 year old boys, which is really, really wasn't fun to be a 12 year old girl, like training with people that you just can't relate with and kind of resent the fact that you're there because they don't want a 12 year old girl that can actually keep up with their workouts. Um, So, yeah, I think that my, my, I never had that opportunity to feel really normal growing up. I mean, I have memories of like, I got to go to school dances and have sleepovers and do things that were fun. Um, But I, we knew, thankfully, I think this is something that people maybe, maybe need to hear. I do really believe that if you set your mind to it and you visualize and you're mentally tough and all the things that you can 1000% do more than you think that you can 100%, 1000%. Is that what separated you, like separated you even as a kid? Like, do you think that you had that type of mindset young, or do you think it was more of a physical? Thing I did or... have that mindset. My yeah. dad and my dad taught me that. Okay. My dad taught me. I will never forget the conversation we had. I was unhappy. I was telling him like, "Dad, I don't know if I want to go How to practice." Were you? Fourteen. Okay. I don't know if I want to go to practice today. Like, you know, hanging out with those older guys. Like, it's, I'm not really happy, and he. 
very heartfeltly, which is out of character for my dad, told me, you know, kind of his athletic experience and some of the things, some of the opportunities he wished that he had had. And he told me that having these opportunities in the long run, it's a fair trade. It's okay if you're unhappy right now because you're creating something bigger that will last longer and that will make you happy. Um, now, with hindsight, I can honestly look back on that and say the things that make me happy aren't winning races. They never, they weren't winning races. My best races ever are races that I did not win. They're the races that forced me to dig the deepest that I ever had. And I didn't win those races. I just was in a place where I wanted to win so bad that I was willing to dig deeper than I'd ever dug before. And those are my most proud moments. Um, and so I think that uh, in hindsight, I'm glad that I was taught to think the way that I taught. But I think there's also something to be said for I was training with teenage boys by the time I was nine. So yes, I believe that everyone can do more than they think they can do through you know, really good mental toughness and positive self-talk and all the things, but there is a line there. Some kids can do freakishly cool things by the time they're 10 years old. And if you're 15 or 16 or 20 and thinking like, well, if I just put my mind to it, I can do those things too. Your neuromuscular system develops intensely from ages nine to 12. And so those are really the key ages that um, we start. A coach can't predict what a kid's gonna be able to do at ages nine to 12. But those, that's the ideal age to start laying the patterns. And I was already identified as being good during that age, age frame, time frame. So I was being given extra attention to make sure that all my patterning was in place and it was good and I was being taught the right things. So because I was good young, I had an advantage physically that um, it was a good combination of my physical advantage and my mentality but I really think that there is a point where genetics plays a factor. Timing, luck, the people in your corner, the, the, the right person saying the right thing at the right time. I could have quit on that day. I could have been like, I'm sick of hanging out with boys. I want to go to sleepovers with my friends. And if my pops hadn't said the right thing at the right time on the right day, I could have just quit. But that's lucky. He didn't know that that was the, the day that I needed to hear it. He just happened to say it. And, um, life has to be good that way too for you to really get to fully optimize your experiences well it's so funny it's it's the um it's looking back and seeing how you got there not really realizing the decisions that you made or were made for you mm -hmm. that kind of put you in that landing spot that you ended up in that were like holy shit i can't believe i'm here and i'm so grateful that i am and, and you don't even know that you're headed there too right um two things i want to add to or jump off of that on one is i think you're 100 percent right everybody can do more than what they think they can do through just being more mentally aware and being able to control their mental status. Mm -hmm. But it's also relative to the person. So yeah, I mean, you can't be 21 and being like, I'm going to be an Olympic ski skater. I'm going to start <laughs> speed skating tomorrow. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> but, not going to work. But when you're feeling really <laughs> tired because you ran 10 miles, you can run five more probably if you just get your mental capacity like under control, right? For sure. Um, but the other thing too that you mentioned there, which is the sacrifice. You know, you sacrifice to being happy at age 14 from going to sleepovers to maybe not necessarily being happy because you won a race, but you medaled in an Olympics, which is awesome no matter what, right? So it's kind of crazy how you don't know what, you're, what you can sacrifice, but when you do, you know at least you're going to get something out of it, whether you make a mistake, you fail, and you learn from it, mm -hmm. or you'll get that outcome that you're actually shooting for instead of that eight hours of happiness that you sacrificed. For sure. One of the one of my favorite, most impactful teammates over the years had this saying that I really liked, and he would say, "Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want." And I think we, as people, tend to associate getting what I want with happiness, and like that's the only thing that's valuable. But actually, I have found over and over again that the experience is actually more helpful in gaining future happiness. And so exactly like you're saying, I can have eight hours of success right now, um, or I can get, you know, take my humble pie and gain my experience. And I'm more likely to have eight weeks of happiness later because I, I was forced to learn that lesson. Um, and that's something I run into with athletes a lot. If they don't win, they think it was a waste of time. And I will ask you guys to do this right now, but I'll ask your listeners as well to, to visualize a time in your life where you just nailed it. 
it could be recently, it could be 10 years ago, but something with one day, man, you were just so on. It feels awesome. You get that feeling in the pit of your stomach and you're like, uh, yeah. I know what that feels like. Are you, are <laughs> I you there? One, no. <laughs> I can't think of one. <laughs> Eric's there. Yeah, you got it. Okay. And now I want you to think of the day where like you were stressed and frazzled and you did absolutely everything that you could possibly do to try to make the situation go right. And gosh darn it, you just couldn't get it to go your way that day. Yeah. Okay, we got that feeling. <laughs> yeah. So you don't get that really like gritty, tough feeling in your in the pit of your stomach. But think about it. When did you learn more? When were, which situation did you come out of with a broader perspective than you'd had going in? I think it's always going to become, it's always going to be the one that you fail at. Like, it's always going to be the one you failed at. We've talked about that a lot now on this podcast. Like, and I'm sure all the listeners know that I'm very adamant on failing forward. And like, that is so much, that's really where you learn. It's mm-hmm. where you gain, like, I don't know, little new pieces of yourself and like learn who the hell you're going to become. It's also when you're stepping outside your comfort zone, too. Right. Like, that's my biggest thing is, like, just trying new things, making yourself uncomfortable, or, you know, even when you don't want to, do it, because then that becomes a time where you, like, you know you can do it again, kind of like we've been talking about. So I think that's, yeah, I mean, the last two, I think I can't think of a time I've been great, because the last two weeks have just been super stressful, and I didn't, like, do anything I was supposed to to the degree that I would want to. But I think, you know, like, the people in my corner would say that I did very well for what I the situation I was in let's say in my, in my work status so it but it's never like I'm a, kind of a perfectionist like if it's not to the T perfect I'm never going to be happy with it and I'll look back and be like I could have done that different I could do this different yeah you know well you have experience there yeah and you don't have you know let me just encourage you that perfect is cool and all it's but it's but it's not real <laughs> it is not it's I had a coach who would describe overtraining and overreaching in this way. And this goes back to like, how do you know if you're working too hard and you're in too much of a state of fatigue? If you think of a flame on a candle and you're running your finger back and back and forth across this flame, you can touch the flame and not get hurt, but you can't hold your finger there. You'll get burned. So overreaching is touching the flame without staying too long. Overtraining is when you put your finger on the fire and just stay there. And I feel the same way about perfection. You can run your finger back and forth over perfection without getting burned. But if you try to hold your finger there and live there, it's going to hurt. Your feelings are going to get hurt because it's not possible to live there. You can only visit. Um, And then that makes those visits really nice. That's true. You know, you you get, that's how I feel about my, my silver medal. Like I'm so grateful to have had an opportunity to feel what perfect feels like. Some of the the hardest learning of my life happened three months after winning the medal because I had made this assumption that when you arrive, you're just perfect forever. When you get a medal, there's some little box that gets checked of like, yep, this one, she's good enough. <laughs> that doesn't happen. I was so disheartened to learn that. I, I don't know why as a, as a 21 year old, I really thought that that was going to be the case, but um. All of a sudden, I life started to go back to normal, and everyone wants to be your friend when you have an Olympic medal. Everyone's calling, everyone wants to hang out all the time. But three months later, it kind of goes back to normal, and you remember who your real friends are, and you remember like, oh, I have to work just as hard at maintaining this relationship as I ever did. Mm-hmm. I don't get a free pass here because I have a medal. Um, I have to work even harder as an athlete now because people have identified me as someone to beat. I have what they have, so they want to beat me. So training is actually harder than it used to be. Um, And the moment I learned this the most was actually dads like to help, right? My dad was very helpful to me at lots of points in my life. But like all dads, sometimes he's very, very concerned in a way that makes me feel like he doesn't trust me. Mm. And like maybe... I'm not being allowed to be my full grown up. And so after the three months after I got a very sincere call from him asking like, what are you going to do? What's your plan B? What comes after skating? You can't skate forever. And I'm sitting here thinking like, I just want a medal. Can we, can you just let me have that for, for a little while? And so I was reminded that you don't get to stop striving. You have to keep moving forward. Um, and that was a really hard lesson to learn. But because my unawareness of those lessons, like 
experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. What I wanted was for my Olympic medal to permanently check the box. Yep, this one, she's good enough. I failed at that, but I learned that, no, relationships are important. You have to put in the work. You have to maintain them. You have to do your job, whether you're an athlete or an accountant or whatever. You have to keep striving because that makes you feel good. Um, and you have to accept feedback from people who are in your corner, even when it hurts, because that's what they're there for. And, um, all of that humble pie tasted awful. It was a brutal time of my life for several years, because after I won the medal uh, that I immediately got hurt, I needed my first hip surgery. I got my medal in February. I needed my first hip surgery in June, came back from it, rehabbed it. I was back on the world cup circuit. I had the best international season of my life but I fell in my best distance at world championships and my back was never the same. And I got two more hip surgeries and then I retired. I, I was never able to come back to compete at that level. So not only did I have that low that comes after you win the medals and realize that you still have a lot more work to do, but I also never really got myself back up out of that. So many bad things happened right in a row after that, that I just kind of stayed down there and I lived there for probably three years. Um, and that was a big thing that inspired my comeback for 2018 because something I would say to myself as an athlete when I was feeling stuck was that you don't need to know what comes next, but you do need to know if what you're doing isn't working. Once you recognize what you're doing isn't working, it doesn't matter which way you try. Anything's better than where you're at. In life, I was in this place where nothing I was doing was working and I didn't know what the next step was, but I at least remembered to take that, to take the step. What anything that I try is going to be better than where I'm at right now. Speed skating was where I, at the time was where I was most comfortable is where, um, have you guys read Jordan, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules of Life? Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal book. One of the first things I think he says, and even like the foreword is you have to keep one foot in chaos and one foot in order. Because if both feet are in chaos, you can't handle it. It feels like your world's falling apart. But if both your feet are in order, then you have nothing that's pushing you, nothing you're striving for. So you have to have one in one. I own that book too, Eric. I can remember too. I like buying books. Okay. There you go. Um, Appreciate that. And at the time, I had both feet in chaos, and coming back to speed skating is what let me put one foot back in order. Sure. I'm comfortable here. I understand this. I know how to do this. And this will give me the ground, the anchoring that I need to get the rest of my stuff figured out. Um, I don't really remember where I was going with that. That's but okay. that's Well, that's a good transition, I think, to kind of – what you were asking before. So oh. then from there, you got into coaching. Like yeah. Talk about that transition, how you made that, why you made that, all the good stuff. So um, the, really it, it's okay. the comeback, uh, it challenged me in so many ways that helped me. Because I had perspective now on what it feels like to be a coach, I could be a different athlete. And then when I was done being an athlete for the second time, because being an athlete the second time, I was able to observe coaches and just not make judgments, not react, but just watch and see coaching in a different light and who really makes a difference. And it's not the person who comes in with the most particular plan every day. It's the person who comes in and meets you where you are at and helps you get better. Even if where you're at is three steps behind where you were yesterday. It doesn't matter that you're not where you were yesterday. It matters that you're here now. And my job is to get you one step closer to where you're going. Those are the coaches that stood out the most to me. And so when I transitioned to coaching, um, there's always the pressure there to be the smartest one in the room, to have the best training program written for that day. I mean, everybody wants to be really good at their job. And I, I do work really hard to be good at my job. And I also remember that when an athlete is coming to me, asking me for help, they don't need me to be perfect. They need me to be where they are today. And, um, I try, you know, air quotes and within reason, I try to be perfect. I try to read all the things and, and uh, learn as fast as possible and adapt quickly to every situation. 
But even on my worst day, when I'm doing all of those things terribly, my athlete doesn't care as long as I'm there for them, exactly where they're at, helping them get one step further. That's the most important part. Um, and so my transition from being an athlete into coaching was very much a gift because I'd had the chance to just observe and then take what I liked and apply it to my own coaching. So what is your end goal with coaching? Ooh, I, have no, I don't know yet. That's a problem. And it's, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, visualize. Yeah. <laughs> I, my, my overall goal is to, is to make as big of an impact possible. And I'm sure you guys, Simon Sinek. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's start with why. Okay, so um, I actually haven't read his book. I Never reference him all the time. <laughs> I only watch his like YouTube. I watch TED his talks. TED Talks. Yeah. yeah. So, but here I am trying to make myself sound like I've read this book. <laughs> I'll cut it out. So you read the book. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but just this idea of like, what is your why? And so for me personally, my why comes back to kindness and being present. Again, I don't need to make that athlete feel bad for being three steps behind where they were yesterday. I need to be kind about, look, this is where you're at. We're going to get better. Let's keep moving forward. Um, and so my long-term goal of coaching is I want to continue to make an impact, um, but I really haven't figured out what way that that's going to be. An impact to what type of athletes? Would you? Because right now you're working with a bunch of different ages, right? That's true. Like where, what age group is you? Oh, this is great. I'm getting some private coaching. (laughs) (laughs) Um, ah, I really like, I really like 16 to 18 year olds because I feel like that is the hungriest age. They know that they have to do the work now so they can get recognized in time to go play at an elite level. I'm sure it's different at different sports. I have a couple figure skaters who are like eight ranged 12 to 15 they're younger, but already at that point, at that age. So I don't know that it's an age so much, but... Well, that kind of peaks a little bit earlier too, doesn't it? That's it why. does. Yeah. yeah. So it's not necessarily their their physical age as much as the type of athlete who, if you want to cross the bridge and get to the next level, but you there's a bottleneck there, the type of athlete who sees that bottleneck coming and is excited to learn how to get through it. Yeah. I love to teach that athlete how to get through Some athletes can't get through. I also like to help that athlete understand that the best races in your life won't be the ones that you win. They'll be the ones that you dug the deepest for. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole nother tier of athlete who you don't have to make it through the bottleneck. You have to figure out what it is that you really, really, really like to do. Who cares if it's not hockey, but you have to find your thing. And then you have to go thrive in that, in that thing. Um, and so I don't know that it matters on the age so much, but I like athletes who are struggling with the approaching bottleneck. I like to help them get through that. Okay. Is there, you want to go? Yeah, I mean, okay. So the reason I asked the question, what's it next for her, like, what's the end goal of coaching is because I, I'm a very competitive person in almost everything that I do. I want to be the best at it. And that's one of the things that I find that is a, actually a weakness of mine where mm. whenever I pick something up, I want to be the best, like. I, when I started playing golf when I was 13, I wanted to be on the PGA Tour. Like, that was my goal. Like, I wanted to be that because I wanted to be the best of the best and, and everything I did. Um, so being a, an Olympic athlete, you have to have that competitive drive mm-hmm. to even make it to that level and then to the medal at that level would be crazier, right? So I was curious to see if you're going to be like, yeah, I want to be the best coach on the Olympic mm-hmm. team. I want to do this and that if that's where you're going to go or not. So that's, and then my next question is going to be, how does one battle with that competitiveness and that drive to be the best that you can be and not settle for maybe being less or just enjoying those wins, but to appreciating those things and understanding that you may not be the best. Yeah. I think you have to do that by defining what is good enough. And so good enough is kind of my keyword. I think everyone has their own thing. Um, but I mistakenly thought that when I would have a medal, I would be good enough. And then when that didn't happen, I went through those couple really hard years, but eventually I was forced to figure out, well, if that isn't it, what does good enough feel like? And this starts to get abstract and mostly mindset based. But what I'm suggesting is process over performance, because if you have a process that you're incredibly proud of, and it really embodies your character, who you who you want to be as a person, not even who you are, but who you're trying to become, 
you're going to feel good about that process with or without the win. Some days you're going to win. You're going to experience that level of perfectness and it's going to be amazing. But some days you're going to lose because life happens and that's a fact. And on those days, you, you hope that you have a process that allows you to carry on feeling proud of who you've become. Love that. Yeah, that's like some that. Gary Vee stuff right that there. That is some Gary Vee stuff. Trust hey. the process, love yeah. the process. And love the hustle, love yeah. the grind. Yeah. No, I, sorry, yeah, that, that's, well, no, just one more like comment about that. It's so true because the process is always so much longer than the end goal. Like, if you can really learn to love the process, you're going to be happier a lot more. Yeah, I the best compliment I think anyone ever gave me was a coach who ended up mentoring me. She introduced me to a group of athletes one time and she gave me this phenomenal compliment. She said, this athlete more than anyone else embodies a student of her sport. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even realize that I was doing it, but when she put a phrase to it, I realized that, yeah, I thrive when I'm learning. When I learn the most effectively, I have a pretty good chance of winning. But I don't thrive off of winning. I thrive off of learning. And when I'm doing that really, really well, I start winning. And so I don't need to perform to feel as though I'm at my best. I need to learn as much as I can as quickly as possible because I like that. And when I'm doing what I really, really like, I start performing. I love that too. Yeah, I find, I find this. I find it actually when I'm having the most fun is actually when I'm doing the best. Oh. So like golf, particularly, like I'm yeah. very hard on myself, and I always want to be perfect. And golf is one of those sports that you'll never be perfect at, especially in 18 holes. Um, but I find that if I'm hanging out with friends that I enjoy playing golf with, I'm really relaxed and I'm just enjoying the game. And that is when I will play the best. Mm-hmm. Like podcasting, some of the best podcasts are like I don't. I'm not trying to be. Joe, the next Joe Rogan, right? Sure. You know, we're just trying to do this kind of for fun, and that's why I find it something that I would excel at because I'm not here trying too hard or over trying to overperform, basically. Or yeah, and I would imagine that you don't have a fear of underperforming yeah. in this in this realm, right? And so I think that's another part of it is that even though yes, we want to strive to overperform because those days feel really great, the fear of underperforming is unbearable. Underperforming itself isn't that bad. You have a bad day, you eat some ice cream, you watch Netflix, it's fine. The fear of underperforming is unbearable. It can handicap you. As it often does. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you have... Oh, no, no, are you going more into this? I got a question about her coaching before we get any further. Yeah. I wanted to jump back into, I don't know exactly what you wanted to go, but I wanted to make sure we got this before. You talked about coaching. You as a coach. Was there ever a coach in your life, childhood, your actual just coaching? Is mm-hmm. there like a one coach that was like, hey, this is this person is why I became a coach or why I wanted to become a coach or thought about it or impacted you so heavily that you know, really at home? Yeah, um, a couple coaches. One was a strength and conditioning coach. His name was Shane Domer. And I learned so many things from Shane, but the number one thing I learned from him was after he had been promoted into a, an administrative role, I was visiting him at his desk one day and he had this little sign posted up and it said, at some point, the only thing that differentiates you from your competitors is your ability to learn faster. And that pretty much sums up the way that he ran his weight room. Like, yeah, you can put your two and a halfs on and your fives on and we're here to get stronger every day, but at some point, everyone's strong. Everyone has a phenomenal elite level coach or person in their corner even if it's not sport. At some point of of competitiveness, everyone has resources and talent. And the only thing that separates you is your ability to learn faster. And that set me on fire to want to learn as fast as humanly possible. Um, And then the next person- So learn about coaching you're saying? Or learn just in general? I would rephrase it now to say to adapt, to learn and adapt faster. Because even if it's not coaching, how many times do you guys see someone who consistently struggles? Um, the, my favorite example is like consistently has road rage, consistently is just irate about bad traffic, right? Um, it happens every day around 8.30 and 3.30 and 5.30. Every single day. It's like clockwork. So That's true. you when I'm talking about learning faster, I'm talking about seeing the pattern and adapting to that pattern faster. Um, so, you know, if I was mindset coaching you, I would say every single day, you know, there's going to be bad drivers and you know, they're going to get you in a really riled up 
angry place. It's the truck drivers that get me. Is it? It is. So you can probably see that coming though, right? You can, can be like, oh, there's a truck up there. He's gonna get me mad. So let me just take three deep breaths and adapt faster this time and not go through all the road rage. And so whether it's coaching or just life, the ability to see the pattern and adapt faster. You're very right. So good, good luck with your good luck with driving tomorrow. They have so <laughs> things to say to that. Tom, I don't drive often. I, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, <laughs> you really drive. <laughs> I've been commuted on a freeway for a lot of my life. Truck drivers are the best. Oh, no. Because, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into why they're the best of the time. Okay. Um, so one thing that I've started to notice in my career, because I have uh, a lot of ambition, especially when it comes to my professional life, um, and a lot of what... I have some of, like, and this is what I've been told, so I'm not trying to be arrogant, but, like, I have some of the intangibles that a lot of people who are in my career try to learn mm -hmm. throughout their time of growing and natural progression from, you know, being an individual contributor to being a leader of people, right? Totally. So I'm at the point where I feel like, oh, I could do that mm -hmm. because I have X, Y, and Z, but I haven't had the experience that comes with going through all those years. So I'm having a really hard time and working mentally to just be patient and understand that person there that's been there for 30 years and may have had to learn how to speak in front of people and how to lead people mm -hmm. um, knows a hell of a lot more than I do, even though I can do those things well or even just mm -hmm. as well or better than them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the best uh, line I heard, which is actually on Andy Sucks podcast, where, you know, a, like a black belt in jiu-jitsu can roll with a white belt in jiu-jitsu and they can roll and the black belt will tap them out four or five times, say in five minutes, and the white belt will be done. And he'll be like, you know, what well, can I do better? And he'll say, nothing like you're doing great with the tools that you have but you've only been training jiu-jitsu for x amount of months and i've been doing it for 10 years i can't give you those nine years mm -hmm. that i have under my belt right because you've either been through something and you've learned how to adapt from it and things like that so you know what's like how does one like and that's a, my thing is just understanding patience and i imagine that especially working with children can be especially from our generation or younger generation where everything is so instantaneous how does one kind of deal with that um, I had a mentor in my comeback. His name was Mark Carlton. He was actually was very instrumental in getting me back involved in my sport at an elite level. And he gave me this advice. And he said, you, what you do is you set, you set your goals. And he recommended three months. And then you put your head down in the weeds. And you don't look, you don't look at where you are. You don't track your progress during that time. Maybe around like the six week mark, you peak up and you're like, oh yeah, okay, I'm still going the right direction. But then you go right back down to the weeds. And after those 12 weeks, then you stand up and you say, have I done it? Have I gotten here? Because if you're judging yourself daily on like, do I have the skills yet? It's going to feel like you're never there. Mm -hmm. But when you get immersed in a problem and you live and you breathe it, and then you come up for air, you have hindsight, you have perspective and competence builds confidence. So even though those three months are brutal because you're just immersed in all the problems, you have built the things that, that are required to have confidence at the next level. Um, and so I feel like I went through something really similar after I was done with the 2018 Olympic trials and Eric knows because he was working with me during that time. I had a platform to, to speak on. Um, I have some decent public speaking skills and I, I had people who were interested in my story, but I didn't, I wasn't very refined in my messaging. I wasn't, I don't even think I had a message. I mean, I did, but, and you can be honest about what it was like working with me at that point, because you'd ask me like, well, what do you want to do? Who do you want to work with? And very similar to how I am now where I'm like, uh, bottlenecks. I don't know. But I was even worse back then. I really didn't. I didn't have a vision, but I had the skills to carry out a vision, but I didn't have a vision. Okay. Um, and so I feel like I, I personally just took a really big step back where I started taking a lot of these like tiny part-time jobs that felt to me like, oh, I have this platform. I want to, I just, I want to go. Like I'm already at 60 miles per hour. Can't I just go? But you can't go. Because there's no vision. Mm -hmm. So I had to start doing like, why don't I just, why don't I teach a yoga class once a week? Why don't I take on a few private clients? I worked at a physical therapy clinic for a while. I worked at a chiropractic clinic for a while. Because I knew that I really wanted to work with how the body works. But I didn't, I didn't have 
I think just kind of what you're describing here is like, I didn't have enough experience to actually take my platform and go. And I still don't think I have enough experience to take my platform and go, but I think I've at least slowed down to 30 miles per hour. And now I can be more aware of like having that vision going the right direction, understanding that you don't need to be going zero to 60 all the time. Sometimes putting your head down in the weeds and going 30 miles per hour, it's slow. It's annoying. You're stuck in traffic. It takes forever. Truck drivers. Totally. But then you get there and you look up and you're like, oh, I'm actually going there. I didn't feel like I was, but I'm, I'm actually heading in the right direction. And I hope that one day I put my head up. No, that's not true. Because I do have more forethought than that. I do have an idea, even if it's not tangibly where I'm going, of the things that I'm trying to cultivate along the way, which is mostly variations of kindness and impacting others and trusting that when I'm being my best self, the best things come my way. Um, But I'm not my best self when I'm trying to go zero to 60. I'm really my best self at 30 miles per hour and um, embracing to suck on that because it sucks to go that slow but that's the only way you get there in 10 years. That's right. I had, I had something similar. It's like, um, when you're losing weight, like you shouldn't weigh yourself every day. Like, no, yeah, yeah, I lost 20 pounds over the course of February until now. And it was like, I didn't actually notice it was happening until well like, it was like, I don't think I was two months in and I was like, holy shit, this is actually working. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things. Well, and then you get that boost of serotonin. Right. Like, oh, it worked. Yep. I did it. And competence builds confidence. You have proven that you are competent at this skill. You have earned your confidence and are now ready to do something harder. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's absolutely no shortcut for that. There's nothing more genuine than hard earned competence and confidence. That's right. Any other questions, Eric? We've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes. It's been super fun. I really enjoyed chatting with you guys. Yeah. (laughs) I just have one more question for Mm -hmm. you. All right. So you keynote speak. Mm-hmm. You're a coach. Mm-hmm. And you may have had one while you were an athlete, but it has to be different. What's your walk up song if you're allowed to have one in the situation? Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, it would be different from what it was. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to have to think this through. It would, it would be something like reggae or islandy because I'm so up. I never listen to pump up music. I'm naturally too anxious. You're already there. Yeah. Well, yes. Kind of yeah. in a bad way, in a way that's like, I am zero to 60 all the time. I need help coming down to 30 miles per hour. So I, it would be something reggae. My favorite islandy type artist is J bug, J boogie. <laughs> yeah. And huh. so I also like revolution. Um, but I can't say for sure. If I have a favorite song, um, can I, is that close enough? Is that a good yeah, enough? No, that's good enough. Okay, yeah, yeah perfect. That's, good, yeah. 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 How does one spell J Boogie? <laughs> Initial J? Yep. B O O G I E. You sound like the whitest person in the world right there. How does I, one spell J Boogie? That's <laughs> pretty much what I sound like. Well, when my, because my husband's a lot more into reggae than I am. I'm into like the islandy kind of poppy stuff, and he really likes like true reggae. So, what's true reggae? Bob Marley. Got it. Yeah, like. It's, uh, I don't really know how to describe it. There are other people besides Bob Marley. Um, none that we would probably know. None that I can even remember. He oh, would yeah. he would run a clinic on it. But <laughs> he's going to be disappointed when he hears this part. I, well, at least he's converted <laughs> me into liking the islandy poppy type stuff. Sure. Yeah. Mr. Sure. Nice. Yeah. All right. Oh, we have to still ask one more question. Oh, we can't really okay. ask you the college. Kids. We can really talk. Go I don't think that. you can ask the other one either, but I, I thought about no, it. I okay. think we can. All right. So mm-hmm. now you're... Whatever age you are. So what would you tell if you could go back, let's say wait, 21 years, so 21 year old self, or mm-hmm. maybe 18 year old self, or whatever time yeah. in your life like, when you need someone to talk to or yeah. you, know, you need some help, what would you tell yourself, you know, that version of yourself, that age of yourself? I would I wish I'd learned a lot faster. People don't need you to be perfect. They need you to be there for them. If you want to be a difference maker, if you want to be someone who stands out from the crowd, no one needs you to be perfect. They need you to connect and be present and be where they are at, be where you are at. Um, you know, this it speaks a lot to, you know, how you said you like to, you want to be the type of person that is there for people. Mm-hmm. And that answer right there speaks, that's actually true now, in my opinion. Well, really I think cool. we, we trick ourselves. We're like, when I'm, when I'm perfect, then I'll be helping others. 
No, no, no. Your self-talk about not being perfect enough is what's keeping you from helping others. And when you disengage from that distraction, you'll be so much more present and make a meaningful difference for the people around you. It's deep. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that. I actually learned that um, from a Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> and not even joking. I was like, a couple years ago, I saw it. I might, it was probably on Facebook or some shit like that. And it was um, Pooh and or, um, what's the piglet went and saw Eeyore. And Eeyore was like, Dad, I don't want to see anybody today. I'm not, I'm not feeling too hot. And they sat down next to him and they're like, and he was like, what are you guys doing? I'm not fun right now. You know, why are you hanging out with me? And like, well, we just know you're in a down place, so we'll just sit here with you. And I was like, oh, like that's what you, you should just, doesn't have to be there fixing anything. You don't have to be talking to somebody out of something or in the, or helping them. It's just sometimes it's just being there is the most important thing. 1,000%. There you go. Winnie the Pooh wins. See? <laughs> you were making fun of her for listening to Disney. Is it Disney? To, yeah, and I don't Come like on. any Disney movies. So. <laughs> As long as I, I have an old friend who says all the things you needed, all the things you need to know, you learned by just playing nice in the sandbox. We know these things. We know the golden rule: treat mm -hmm. others the way oh, you yeah. want to be treated. It's it's simple, but it's not easy. It's actually quite hard. But you already know the things to do. It's just a matter of slowing down and being honest and connecting with people and, and doing them. That's right. Love that. All right, so get the great. plug yeah. um, where people can find you. Yeah, so I'm on Instagram, um, at Kat Adamick. I also, I mean, if you, there's a couple places that I am. If you're into hockey, if you're into ice sports, and you want to do strength and conditioning or skating work specifically with me, uh, you'd want to go to scoresedgehockey.com and do all of my work there through Scores Edge. If you want some mental skills coaching or, you know, maybe some keynote speaking, in that case, I'd say go to Fix Your Mindset. Either way, you're going to be able to find my email address and get in touch with me. Uh, Instagram is where I'm the most present on social media. And so if, if I would recommend, if you want to be in touch on social media, that is the way to go and check out at Kat Adamek. Awesome. Sweet. Eric. Oh man. On Instagram is where I'm most active too. Eric under dash has 22. He on purpose this time. Okay. <laughs> he didn't know his Instagram was the first time he did this. He didn't know what? His Instagram. I did not know my Instagram. I, I gave someone my email today. I couldn't remember if it was an underscore or not. I really couldn't. I was very embarrassed. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> so I'm with you. I'll t I just told the person, like, I'm so, I'll, t I'm going to memorize that. <laughs> um, and then I'm at Chakubitz, at J A K U B I C Z. I am most active on Twitter. Um, so find me there. And then I'm also on Instagram at Andrew Jakubitz on everything else. Um, so come find me, friend me, add me, whatever it is. And then the podcast, we have our own website, casualmillennialspodcast.com. Um, and then we are also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We just gave away a pair of Cross headphones. Have a couple more in the back room waiting to give away too. So follow us there to keep an eye out for those as well as our latest episodes. Um, so also DM us or reach out with who you think we should bring on next. Um, can be somebody local, could be somebody not. Uh, could, could be you. See. It Ooh. could be you. It could be you. Um, you just need to get through Eric's screening process, whatever that is. So you saying hello. <laughs> to being a nice person there it is. Um, so we appreciate you listening and uh, we'll see you next episode cheers cheers thanks guys